1887, Heinrich Hertz makes a discovery called the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect says when light strikes a piece of metal or some other surface, but usually metals, sometimes an electron is ejected. Now, he tried to explain the photoelectric effect. He tried to explain what he saw, what he discovered, using what we call classical theory. Classical theory, by the way, we loosely define as pre-Einstein. So Einstein kind of made his debut on the world stage around 1905. Prior to that, we have classical physics, classical theory. And he tried to explain this photoelectric effect using classical theory, pre-Einstein physics, or another synonym for classical theory or pre-Einstein physics is wrong physics. Now, classical theory works for us in a lot of cases. It's a good approximation for a lot of things, but not for this. Classical theory predicts that if the electron is not being ejected, we need more light to get the energy to cause an electron to be ejected. But that didn't agree with the observations. Hertz and his contemporaries, everyone between 1887 and 1905, try different things, and no matter what they did, they couldn't make the observations match the theory. If a certain kind of light didn't cause photoemission, then it didn't matter how much of it you had, it wouldn't cause photoemission. Classical theory predicted that it would. Classical theory was wrong. Now, fast forward 18 years to Einstein in 1905. This is kind of the beginnings of modern physics. We sometimes call it quantum physics or Photon theory. I'm not going to say that that's post Einstein, right, Nico? But um, it really is. It's Einstein and then after Einstein is photon or quantum theory. I'll say post. I'll say post Einstein. But of course, that includes the time of Einstein as well. And of course, this is correct. This explains the observations that were made after 1887 with the photoelectric effect very, very well. And this basically says that light, or EMR in general, is a particle. And that particle has an energy equal to H times F. Okay, the big thing with this, seems like it's such a small equation, right? But it's huge. When it boils down to it, it's huge. Okay, because it says, it acknowledges that energy is not related to the amount of it that we have. We got brighter light, so what? We got light shining on something for a longer period of time, so what? We don't get our energy from brighter light or light shining for a longer period of time. We get our energy from the frequency or the type of light. That means that if red light is not causing electrons to be ejected, maybe we try violet light or ultraviolet light Maybe then electrons will be ejected because the photons have a higher frequency and therefore have a higher energy. And guess what? The theory, photon theory, um, predicted the observations that were made with, um, with the photoelectric effect post-1887. So the theory that Einstein came up with worked really, really well. So that's why we say classical theory or pre-Einstein is wrong because it didn't explain things well. Einstein photon theory, quantum theory is correct because it explained all of the observations correctly. Let's take a look at the table that we were working on on Friday, and then we'll go back to some equations here, okay? And then we'll do a couple of example questions here. Um, if we have light that is below the threshold frequency, and by the way, do you guys remember what the threshold frequency is? Threshold frequency is the minimum EMR frequency necessary to eject an electron. So if you have red light is not causing electrons to be ejected, orange light is not causing it, yellow light all of a sudden starts causing electrons to be ejected, then the threshold frequency would be in the range of yellow light. Anything below that, nothing happens. Anything above that, something happens. Electron or electrons are ejected. Below the threshold frequency or... You guys remember the threshold wavelength is inversely related? 
If we talk about the minimum frequency necessary being the threshold frequency, then the maximum wavelength is the threshold wavelength. So we're below the threshold frequency and we're above the threshold wavelength here. What happens when we increase the EMR frequency? Nothing. As long as we're still below the threshold frequency or above the threshold wavelength, then nothing's going to happen, no matter what we do to the frequency. What about the wavelength? Nothing. As long as we stay below, nothing's going to happen to the frequency, to the sorry, to the uh, energy, to the emission of electrons, whatever. What if we increase the intensity, which means the same thing as having more photons? If we're below the threshold frequency, nothing. Good. Nothing's going to happen. And if we increase the time of exposure, which really amounts to almost the same thing. We're just getting more photons. Nothing's going to happen here either. So the bottom line is what I want you to take away from this column is that if you're below the threshold frequency, it doesn't matter what you do, like to anything, increase, decrease, this value, that value, it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to happen. Electrons will not be ejected as long as you're below that value. All right. What if we're above the threshold frequency though? What if our frequency is bigger than the minimum possible frequency, or what if it's smaller than the maximum possible wavelength, the threshold wavelength? Well, if you increase the frequency of the EMR, and you increase the frequency, the effect that that has is that it increases the energy of the photon. You understand the notation that I'm using there? If we increase the frequency of the photon, then we're increasing the energy of the photon because E is equal to H times F, right? Increase frequency, increase energy. What effect does that have? Well, if the photon that's causing all of this to happen increases its energy and we're above the threshold frequency, then the effect that that's going to have is that it's going to increase the energy of the electron the kinetic energy of the electron. So you will get an electron ejected still in a one-to-one -one ratio. One photon causes one electron. But if you increase the frequency of that photon, then the electron's energy is going to be higher. In other words, it's going to be moving faster. If yellow light barely causes an electron to be ejected, then ultraviolet light will cause an electron to be ejected, but that electron will be moving faster once it's ejected. Increased frequency increases the energy of the photon, increases the kinetic energy of the electron. Sometimes we say the photo current increases as well. That just means that, look, if you get electrons ejected, electrons moving, that's an electric current. The electric current is going to be higher because there's more electrons. Uh, sorry, because the kinetic energy of the electrons. Sorry. Sorry, made a, made a mistake there. Put that in the wrong place. If you're increasing the current, then you're not increasing the kinetic energy. You're increasing, you're increasing the number of electrons, right? We haven't done anything to the number of electrons here at all. Increasing the frequency doesn't change the number of electrons. It simply changes the energy of those electrons. Okay, what happens if we increase the uh, wavelength? Well, increasing the wavelength is the same as decreasing the frequency. So the effect that that's going to have is that it's going to decrease the energy of the photon. Now, let's assume that we're still above the threshold frequency. If we're still above the threshold frequency, then we're going to still get electrons ejected, but the electrons that are ejected are going to be less energetic. Still a one-to-one -one ratio, right? One photon, one electron, 25 photons, 25 electrons. Increase in the frequency or the wavelength only affects the energy of the electrons, not the number of them. But if we increase the intensity or if we increase the time of exposure, both of which are more photons, then what's going to happen here is that we're going to, we're going to now increase the number of electrons that are ejected. This is when we're going to increase the current. When we talk about a photocurrent, what we really just mean is 
uh, a measure kind of of the amount of electrons that are flowing per second. If we get more electrons, then we've got a higher current. And the reason we get more electrons is not because we increase the frequency or the energy or the wavelength of the photon, rather we increase the number of photons. And we can do that in a couple of ways. We can do it by increasing the intensity or we can do it by increasing the time of exposure. Both of those, more photons, cause more electrons to be ejected. Now, the very first equation we learned in photon theory looked like this. E is equal to H times F equals HC over lambda. That's still valid. Even though it's not just valid for the photoelectric effect, it's valid anytime we have a photon. We can certainly use it within the photoelectric effect. The second one was for the work function. The work function or the minimum energy necessary to eject an electron would be equal to Planck's constant times the minimum frequency necessary to eject an electron, or HC over lambda, lambda max, good. Minimum energy, work function, Planck's constant times threshold frequency, HC over threshold wavelength. The next one relates the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons of course, the value of that is 1 half mv squared, to what we call the stopping potential. Remember this from Friday? Once an electron has been ejected, sometimes we want to stop it. Now, why we would want to stop it becomes a little bit clearer later on today. But for now, just trust me that sometimes we'd want to stop it. If we did, then we would find that the kinetic energy of the electron was converted to potential energy. It's like a car going up a hill, right? Those problems we did back in unit two, our electricity unit. When a charged particle slows down, kinetic is converted to potential energy. And then finally, the last one I'm going to put in red because it's not on our data sheet. It says HF, which is the energy of the photon that strikes the metal, is equal to EK max. The energy that we start with is equal to the energy that we end with, plus plus what? Plus the energy that we used up in the process of ejecting the electron. This is what we start with. This is what we end up with. This is what we used up. If we end up with eight and we used up two, then the energy that we must start it with must have been 10. Does that make sense? This is really just the law of conservation of energy. Sometimes it's helpful to remember that it's the law of conservation of energy because we, have, we either have to remember the equation or derive the equation as it's not on our data sheet. Now, the one that's in red is a pretty big one, right? It's an important one for a number of reasons. One, because it is the most commonly used equation within the photoelectric effect. And why is it the most commonly used one? Because it's so versatile. There's so many options. We can replace HF with HC over lambda if we need to. We can replace EK max with one half mv squared if we need to, or qv stop if we need to. We can replace w, the work function, with hf0 or hc over lambda max if we need to. So there's all kinds of different combinations of things that we can use here to replace some of the variables in that equation. Here's a rule of thumb for you. If you got a problem and you got your givens written down, and you're not sure within about five seconds which equation you're going to use, pick this one. Hey, pick this one. If in doubt, go with this one. Hey, if it doesn't work out for you, all right, go to another one. But if you haven't figured it out in five or ten seconds which equation to use, it's almost certainly going to be that one. And the reason you might not notice that one right away is because it does get a little bit tricky with all the different possibility for substitutions in there. One more thing, and then we'll do an example here. I told you the other day, last week, that you could use joules and electron volts pretty much whenever you wanted. But there was a couple spots when you had to use joules. And I said I'd tell you when that was. If you use either of these equations, the 1 half mv squared or qv stop, you must use joules all through the problem. If it just says ek, 
anything. The electron volts, joules is fine. But if you use one FMP squared or QV stop, it's got to be joules. Anything else, whatever you want. One FMP squared or QV stop, it's got to be joules. Let's take a look at an example that's on the sheet that I handed out um, uh, a few minutes ago to you. There's two examples on that sheet. One of them is number three and one of them is number four. We're going to do number four first here. Let's take a look at the bottom one. It says the work function of a particular metal is four EV, four electron volts. Now, we're not going to necessarily worry about those units because the normal units for these problems are either joules or electron volts. It says two photons are inserted upon the metal. One that has a frequency of 9.9 times 10 to the 14, and the other has a wavelength of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7. Do each of them cause photo emission? In other words, do each of them cause the electrons to be ejected? Well, there's a couple ways I can do this. From this, I can calculate the threshold frequency, and I can calculate the threshold wavelength. And then I can compare these two numbers to the threshold frequency and wavelength to see if they're above or below. But I want to do it a little bit differently. I want to say the energy of this photon is HF. I'm going to use the 4.14 value because I'm in electron volts. When I multiply those two numbers together, I don't know what the threshold frequency is, but I know that the energy of that photon is 4.10. Would that photon cause electrons to be ejected? You need 4.00 electron volts to cause an electron to be ejected. We have 4.10. Would electrons be ejected? Yes. If we have one photon, then one electron would be ejected. If we have 37 photons, then 37 electrons would be ejected. Okay, what about this one? Let's find the energy of this one. Easy to go to HC over lambda. Once again, we're going to use 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 because we're in electron volts. Divided by lambda, which is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7. That's going to give us, without knowing what the threshold frequency or threshold wavelength is, we're going to know in just a second that the energy of that photon is 3.55, which is below the work function. So in other words, the threshold frequency of that photon of, the, of that metal, whatever it is, is greater than the frequency of the photon that we have. Electrons would not be ejected. You would say yes. And here would say no. All right, I'd like you to take a look at worksheet number 20 right now, specifically questions three to seven for the time being. You remember a couple little things, right? Joules versus electron volts. When you can use electron volts, when you have to use joules. Um, be consistent. If you're using electron volts, that's fine. Usually, just stick with electron volts. And remember, finally, that if you're not sure within about five, ten seconds which equation to use, pick the one that's not on your data sheet. Pick the red one. Okay, we'll give you about, uh, I'll give you about eight minutes or so to work on those questions right now. I want to take a quick peek at number seven and then we'll do another example here. It says, calculate the stopping voltage or stopping potential of a photoelectron. That just means an electron that's been ejected. And again, I'll tell you why in a few minutes, why you'd want to do that, why you'd want to eject an electron and stop it. That is a speed of 5.0 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. So what we're going to do here is uh, write down that equation that relates the kinetic energy of the, of the ejected electron to the potential energy that it has after it comes to a stop. So really what this is is conservation of energy, right? We have a conversion of kinetic energy to potential energy. Um, we know the mass of the electron Mass, same as the mass of any other electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. 
The speed of the electron, we know. Hey, don't forget to square that. 5.00 times 10 to the 5. The charge, it's negative, but we drop the sign of the charge whenever we plug it into an equation. And we just solve for the stopping potential here. I can't remember what our except to be, but you guys can do the math there. So a different equation that we've seen, but one that it fits the givens quite well here without going into that conservation of energy question, equation that I said doesn't appear on your data sheet. HF is equal to EK plus the work function. Be there. Let's take a look at question number three now, example number three. This is the one that's supposed to be on your example question sheet, um, but it's not. So I'm just going to ask you maybe as we're going through this one, just to write down the givens. Don't need to necessarily copy out the question unless you really want to. If you write down the givens, you're probably good here. It says, the wavelength of EMR incident on a photoelectric surface is 5.0 times 10 negative 7 meters. This is the wavelength of the EMR. This is not the threshold wavelength or the threshold frequency. We don't know what the max is. All we know is this is what the wavelength of the photon is. We want to know the max speed of the ejected electron. We do know the work function is 0.50. EV. Doesn't look like we have much here. I'll give you five seconds. I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint and five seconds to come up with an equation for this. Anybody? All right. If nobody comes up with an equation in five seconds, what do we go with? Remember we said, if you can't come up with an equation in five seconds, go with the red one. Now, we're going to have to change this around quite a bit. HF becomes HC over lambda. EK becomes one-half MV max squared, because we're looking for speed plus the work function. What value of Planck's constant do you want to use there? Pro probably electron volts, right? Because that's what we got work function measured in. Anybody want to challenge that? Got to use joules. Yeah, why do we got to use joules? Because of that, right? If we left it HC over lambda equals EK plus W, we'd be fine in electron volts. But as soon as we introduce 1 FMV squared or QV stop, we've got to use joules. If that confuses you, then just always use joules. Let's convert this, by the way, to joules. We say 1 EV is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules equals 0 0.5 EV over X joules. X ends up being equal to 8.0 times 10 to the negative uh, 20 joules. So let's use 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. That's 3 times 10 to the 8. Lambda is 5 times 10 to the minus 7. There we go. Okay, let's do the math on this now. We'll do the left-hand side first. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8. Divide that by 5 times 10 to the minus 7. Is that right? Sorry, that should have been what? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Now let's subtract from that the work function. So subtract 8 times 10 to the minus 20. Let's multiply that by 2 to get rid of the half. Let's divide that by the mass of the electron. And then let's score root that. If you're having trouble with the algebra there, just let me know. I get 8.35 times 10 to the 5. meters per second. It's a pretty common speed, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Remember, we've always said charged particles usually 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 meters per second. For homework, I'd like you to finish up worksheet number 20. You've already worked on a number of those questions. I want you to finish up the rest of them for homework, please. I'd like you to take a look at your second handout today. That's the 
diagram of the experimental apparatus I handed it a little while ago. Um, specifically, I want you to focus on this spot right here. This is an electron emitting metal surface. Listen, it only emits electrons if the frequency of these photons is greater than the threshold frequency, right? If we're below the threshold frequency, nothing's going to happen. We, we got nothing in this experiment if our photons are below the threshold frequency. So we have to assume that they're above the threshold frequency. When that happens, when this photon, well, three electrons are being ejected, so it must mean three photons were above the threshold frequency, these electrons start moving away from this plate. They start moving toward the other one that we call the collector. Now, this collector is charged positive. And the reason it's charged positive is because we have a power supply down here that's set up such that the positive side of it is on the left side and the negative side is on the right side. So we got one collector, one plate that is positive, one plate that's negative as a result of that. Now, in between there, we have an ammeter, which is designed to measure electric current. And you guys remember from last unit, electric current is given by the symbol I. When electrons are ejected here, they're attracted toward the collector plate, and then they continue to go around like this, through the ammeter, and then back here, making my electron emitting metal surface negative. This ammeter measures an electric current because I have electrons flowing. We haven't really discovered anything yet. It's kind of a neat thing that, yeah, we can get an electric current here, but in the end, we haven't really measured or discovered anything yet. This becomes more useful if I flip this power supply around. Let's make this the negative side and this the positive side. That makes this negative and it makes this positive. Now, if my photons are still above the threshold frequency, then electrons will still be ejected. But now these electrons are going to get repelled by the collector. I've got a potential difference. It's backwards now that slows them down. What I want to do is adjust the potential difference on this power supply to the point where I can stop these electrons dead in their tracks. How do I know when they're stopped? I adjust the power supply, I stop the electrons. How do I know when they're stopped? I can't see them with my eyes. Even those of you who can see better than I can, can't see them with your eyes. How do you know when those electrons have stopped flowing? Yeah? Good. The ammeter reads zero. So at the point where the ammeter reads zero, the electrons have stopped. I've stopped them dead in their tracks. I can measure the potential difference across that power supply that made that happen. That gives me my stopping potential. And from my stopping potential, I can calculate the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons. So I fire one photon, I measure the stopping potential, and then I calculate the max kinetic energy. I fire another photon of a different frequency, I get a new stopping potential and a new max kinetic energy, and so on and so on and so on. This is what I end up with. Don't copy this table down, okay? This is what I end up with. Frequency and, and uh, max kinetic energy of the ejected electrons. For each frequency, there's a different stopping potential and a different max kinetic energy. Then what do you think I do with this? Graph it. Don't copy this down either. It's the shape of this that's the important part. If you just sketch the shape of it, that's, that's good. On the y-axis is kinetic energy. On the x-axis is frequency. Notice it's a straight line, but notice it does not go through the origin here. We know how to do this, right? What's the equation for any straight line graph? We've done this a bunch of times now, just not for this graph. What's the equation for any Straight line graph. Y equals mx plus b. Good. On my y axis, I've got ek max. M is the slope. On my x axis, I've got frequency. And there is, there is a y intercept here. So we've got to include that. Ek is equal to slope times the frequency plus the y intercept. Now what? Now what do you do? 
Yeah, see which one matches up with. The one that matches up with it is going to be HF is equal to EK max plus W. Right? Frequency in EK. Rearrange it. EK max equals HF minus W. Start crossing things off. Look, EK max disappears. F disappears. What am I left with? The slope is equal to H. Why would we want to stop an electron dead in its tracks? Why would we want to see what the stopping potential is? Maybe because we want to find out what the Planck's value of Planck's constant is. What do you think B represents? The y-intercept. If we extended that back here, what do you think the y-intercept would represent? Oh, we're almost done. I know it's like 35 degrees in here. The y-intercept, it's slope times f plus b. It's h times f minus w. The y-intercept is negative w. You want the work function, take the y-intercept, the absolute value of the y-intercept. And one more, and then I'm going to call it a day. This is for you smart people out there, which is all of you. How do you find the threshold frequency? There's two ways. I'll be happy if you tell me one. Yeah? Yeah. It's the x-intercept. Good. This is the value of frequency at which electrons begin to have a kinetic energy, at which they begin to be ejected. So that's the threshold frequency. Now, the other thing you could do is write down that equation and say, okay, given two of the three variables here, I could find the third by calculating it. Make sense?